Going higher with Jesus, proclaiming his kingdom purposes, and receiving a greater revelation of God's word. Today, on A Higher Place, we have Reverend Neil Lawrence bringing us a word from the throne of God. May you be enriched by the word of the Lord. In the movies and in the car cartoon books, there's a famous story that everyone knows. A story of someone who can fly. He can jump taller than a, the tallest building. He can have bullets shot at him and they bounce right off. He can hear very well. He can even hear through buildings. He has x-ray vision. He can see through buildings. And he is basically indestructible. His name is Superman. And uh, it's an amazing story that people enjoy watching in the, in the movies and they also enjoy reading them in the cartoon books. And this story of Superman uh, it captures people's imagination. Is it possible that there could really be such a thing as Superman? That we could, uh, could even ourselves attain one day to become like Superman? Well, today I want to talk to you about that story. But it's a story that comes out of the Bible. A story of the real, genuine Superman. The one that causes people around the world to worship. Worship God and worship this person who came from heaven and became a Superman. His name is Jesus Christ. And he died for our sins. And he bore our sins on the cross and killed them. And he made us to have the same kind of power that he has. He has transferred that power to us. And he has given us the power of an indestructible life. And that is what I want to speak to you about today. In Hebrews, we see uh, the description of who Jesus is from the point of view of the temple and of the priesthood. We are told in Hebrews chapter 6, 19 through 20, and also Hebrews 7, 16, that we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where Jesus, who went before us, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. He has become a priest not on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. And then also in Matthew chapter 27, verse 50, it describes something that happened when Jesus died on the cross. It's quite amazing. It says, And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit, and at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rock split, the tombs broke open, and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. So we see that when Jesus died, he released a, a power that is quite amazing, the power of an indestructible life. And we are told that when he entered the Holy of Holies, he sent that, that holy power back down to earth, and we now operate in it. The believers were promised on the day of Pentecost that they would have all power given to them to reach the whole world with the gospel, to reach out into the harvest and bring in the harvest. First, let's look at the scripture, and we'll look at the different uh, facts that are, are shown to us about our salvation. First, it says that we have this anchor for the soul. Now, when we talk about an anchor, we think about a ship, maybe a big ship. And uh, a, a giant ship weighs hundreds of thousands of tons. And uh, if it wants to be stable in, in a storm or it, it wants to park somewhere and wait, it, it rolls a chain out, which is hooked to an anchor and, and a large wire or even a rope, and it goes all the way to the bottom of the ocean, and it digs into the, to the soil of the ocean, and it grabs onto some rocks, and it holds there. And even though the ship is being tossed and turned by the waves, the anchor holds there on the rock. And it can be even a 1,000 feet down, 
into the ocean, but the anchor is holding that ship from being swept away by the storms. That's how an anchor works. But in our case, we are told that we have this anchor for, for our soul, that it is in Jesus Christ. And that anchor doesn't anchor down in the ocean, but it anchors up in heaven. Through the Holy of Holies, it is anchored to the throne room of God. It is anchored right to the throne of God itself. And Jesus Christ made the way for that anchor for our soul to be held in heaven, never to be swept away by the storms of life, never to be swept away by the evil things in this life, never to be swept away even by our own flesh. We have this anchor for our soul, and it is anchored in heaven. That's quite amazing and quite powerful. It says that it enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. Now, what does this mean? What is the importance of the curtain? And what is the importance of the inner sanctuary? Unless you understand the temple worship, you would not understand this. You see, in the temple, there were three areas. There was the inner sanctuary, or the Holy of Holies, and there was a sanctuary outside of that where the priests went, the holy place, and then outside where the average people went, and even the court of the Gentiles. So not everybody was allowed into the inner sanctuary, and only the high priest was allowed to enter the Holy of Holies or the, the most inner sanctuary once a year on the Day of Atonement where he offered sacrifice for the people's sins. So we are told that this anchor for the soul, which is Jesus Christ, it entered the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. You see, there was a curtain, and it was very thick and very big, and... Um, it, it, it protected the people from God. Why did the people need protection from God? Because of their sins. You see, whenever you're talking about being in the presence of a holy God, you cannot enter with sin. So that curtain was protecting us from God, from His wrath. And, and that curtain uh, is where Jesus entered in. He entered through the curtain into the Holy of Holies, and He made salvation. He sprinkled His blood for us once and we are saved. The Holy of Holies is, is here with us now because Jesus split that curtain in two when he died. That, that shows that, that we enter into heaven through what Jesus did. It says there in Hebrews that he entered on our behalf. Jesus made the way for us. Jesus is the way. Not only did he make the way or he show us the way, but he himself is that way. It entered the inner sanctuary. It says in Matthew 27, he gave up his spirit and at that moment the curtain of the temple was torn in two. This can only mean one thing. The curtain of the temple being torn in two can only mean one thing because it was there to protect man from God and only the high priest could enter once a year to offer uh, blood sprinkled on the, the mercy seat for the sins of the people. We were not allowed to enter in. We were separated from God. Not because he separated us, but because our sins separated us. But we are told when Jesus died, that veil was torn in two. And that can mean only one thing. That the separation between God and man was removed. Now we have access, not to the earthly holy of holies, but to the heavenly holy of holies. Because a few years later, the temple was destroyed. So the physical temple on earth really doesn't matter much. Only was what, it, what matters is what it was representing. That is the heavenly temple and the heavenly holy of holies, which is the throne room of God. And Jesus made the way for us. He anchored our soul there on the throne of God forever and ever. It says in Hebrews that our salvation is on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. The foundation of our salvation is Jesus' indestructible life. Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection are the most historically attested fact. There's nothing in history, ancient history, recent history, that is more attested than the, the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In fact, there is more historical evidence of Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and ministry than there is that even Julius Caesar even existed. There's more evidence of that, of Jesus, than there is even of Julius Caesar, the famous Roman emperor, that he even existed. 
Jesus' life is historically attested, and it is the most historically attested fact from the ancient world. You see, our foundation of our salvation is on the basis of the power of his indestructible life and the historical evidence that he did what he did. I want to try to describe to you what this means, the mechanics or the engineering of our salvation. What does it mean when Jesus entered the, the, the heavenly holy of holies and made sal uh, salvation for us by sprinkling his, his blood there on the throne of God? What does it mean when, when we say that he, he, he lived a perfect life and died a perfect death? What does it mean? How, how did he actually accomplish our salvation? I want to describe it with words to you. Jesus, who has been God from all eternity past, because he sat with the Father in the throne with the Spirit upon them from eternity past. He's always been there. He never, there never was a time that Jesus did not exist as God. He's always existed as God, as the eternal Word of God, as the eternal Son of God. Then he was born like one of us. He came from that high position from the throne of God and entered mankind through birth into a virgin. And then we have both fully God and fully man in one being. That's who Jesus is. He's fully God and fully man in one. That's why the, the artwork oftentimes shows Jesus standing there like this. This was a symbol to the people uh, uh, of the medieval world and, and uh, European world. Fully God, fully man, ruler of the universe. This is the symbol. And you see him standing there like that. So Jesus entered and became like one of us. He took our weak flesh upon himself. What he inherited from Mary was not perfection. He inherited our weakness. He inherited our ten tendency to sin. He inherited the tendency to sin that Adam gave all of mankind. And people might say, well, I thought he was perfect. He was perfect. He lived a perfect life. But he walked around with imperfect flesh. If not, then what did he get from Mary? Was it just a phantom? No, it was the weak flesh that we carry around, but he defeated it. He defeated the tendency to sin by being sinless himself. He lived the perfect life without sinning, then offered himself up as a sacrifice on the cross, and he died a perfect death. In other words, he did not deserve to die because he had never sinned. Therefore, his perfect death or his death in perfection scored the goal of heaven for us. When we believe in what he did and obey what he says, his perfection in life and his perfection in death are transferred to us. And we have access to heaven through the Holy of Holies where he went. So that is the description of how he accomplished our salvation and how he transferred this indestructible power of life to us. You see, it was on this basis of the power of an indestructible life that we have our salvation. Not that we can do anything to accomplish it. We are too weak. Even as believers in Christ, we're too weak. We have to continually rely on him day by day, hour by hour, moment by moment, throughout our whole life, we depend upon him. Because our salvation is not in ourselves and our good works, but it is in him who accomplished our salvation through the power of an indestructible life. He could not be destroyed because he never sinned. The Bible says very clearly that he who sins must die. Well, Jesus never sinned. Therefore, he didn't deserve to die. So when he physically died on the cross, he was not destroyed. He remains forever. Instead, he destroyed destruction. He destroyed death because he was sinless. And he made the way to transfer that sinlessness and that life to us and that eternity to us. Amen? If we have what Jesus accomplished living in us, then we are indestructible. I'm not talking about a little child who, who imagines himself indestructible when he plays his games and and, and it's kind of fun to watch that. I'm talking about a real thing. 
something that is eternal, something that can never be taken from us, the power of an indestructible life. Though we die, yet we will live. As Jesus promised in his teachings, he says in, in John chapter 5, verse 24, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. He also says in John chapter 11, verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. These are quite amazing claims. And they, 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 they could be the claims of a madman unless Jesus had done what he did. He died on the cross and he resurrected and defeated death. And because Jesus did what he did, these claims that he was making have come true. And it's our job now to activate God's power in our lives. In order to activate God's power in our lives, we must ask or pray according to his will. We ask and we pray according to his will. That's how we activate that power, that power of an indestructible life. Therefore, if we, if we do not, uh, we ourselves do not determine what to ask, but God does. Jesus said, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Matthew 4.4. 4. He was quoting the Old Testament in Deuteronomy, which says the same thing. Man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. You see, God's word is our life. He spoke us into existence. He spoke the creation into existence. And he speaks our salvation into existence. His word brings us life. And when we live by his word, the very thing that Adam and Eve lost in the garden, we restore it by listening and living according to his word. Then we have life. God's word is his will. And it is his power. God's word is his word is his power. You cannot separate the two. You cannot separate the three. They all go together. We have uh, His Word, and when we love His Word, we love His will. When we love what He says, both in the Bible and what He speaks to us in the Spirit, when we love that, we have His will. And we have His life and His power. Because His Word and His power have been spoken to us. And Jesus spoke many words when he was here ministering on the earth. He spoke through the apostles and prophets. The Bible says in Revelation that the spirit of prophecy is the spirit of Jesus. So even the ancient prophets were Jesus speaking through them. And that is life. It is through his word that we have life. You see, God's word is God's will, is his life. You cannot have life without having his word. You cannot serve God without serving His will. You cannot love God without loving His will. There are many false preachers who twist around the power of God's Word. They use the Scriptures for their own gain, for their own benefit. And it's a very evil thing. Today, with the kind of prosperity preaching that is being prom promoted um, in the church, ministers are guilty of twisting the truth of the Word of God they think they can manipulate his power by twisting the word. These false preachers are tickling the ears and deceiving many, but they are not preaching the kingdom of God. They twist around the word of God and they use it for their own personal gain. And it's a very wicked thing. The word of God is not like a magic formula. It cannot be used outside of what God's will is. I've heard stories of even of people like pre preachers from Uganda who have come here and they have preached uh, maybe several weeks long and during their preaching they, they promise all kinds of things and they, they preach a prosperity gospel, a false gospel and they, they, pre they promise that uh, if people will give their bicycles that next week they will receive a car. And people are so caught up with what they're saying that they end up surrendering their bikes. And so that, that Ugandan preacher has hundreds of bicycles that have been given to him, him 
and, and the people are there waiting for their car. And so he secretly goes and takes the bicycles and sells them, pockets the money, and runs away to, back to Uganda, having deceived the people with his prosperity preaching. That's what will happen to you if you believe a false word that is not the true word of God, the true life of God, the true will of God. You will be deceived, and you will become self-deceived as well. The Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. People have used this in a very false way. They have said, you see, all you have to do is believe in God. It says right here in Psalm 37 that God will give you the desires of your heart, and that's how they preach it. But it doesn't say that. It says, delight yourself in the Lord, and then he will give you the desires of your heart. Now let's look at that in a, in a different way. If you delight yourself in God, meaning his will and what he wants, then he will put his desires in your heart. He will give you the desires of your heart. He will make your heart like his heart. Your desires become his desires. His desires become your desires. You become one with God. You are in agreement with his will. That's what that scripture means. When you delight yourself in him, he puts his will in your heart. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. These are the words of Jesus as he was leaving his disciples in John chapter 14. They were in the upper room having the Last Supper, and he gave them these encouraging words. And people use this scripture, and they use the idea of in the name of Jesus, katika jina ya yesu, they use this in a very magical way. They think by repeating over and over, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, the more they say it, they think the more that the demons will be pounded and driven away. As if repeating it like the pagans repeat it is somehow going to scare the demons. Let me tell you, all you have to do is say in the name of Jesus one time, that's enough. Because it has power. But it's not magic power. It's not magical power. You cannot say, in the name of Jesus, I will have this Mercedes next week, and then you have a Mercedes, unless it's God's will. People deceive themselves by using the name of Jesus in a magical way. You see, when, when you say, when Jesus said, you can ask anything in my name, he means according to his will. According to his will. Because you see, name means word. It equals word. Word equals will, and will equals nature, and nature equals person. So when you're asking in the name of Jesus, you are asking according to his nature, according to who he is, according to his person. You're saying, I know that you're right here, Lord, with us. We are in your throne room because you tore the veil in two. Now we're right here with you. Now, according to you, do this, do that. We are asking according to his name. It means we're asking according to him that we know he's right here with us. And if it's his will, it will be done as he promised. Name equals word equals will equals nature equals person. You can't use it like a magic formula. That's an insult to God. It's an insult to Jesus. It shows you don't really love him. You don't really know who he is. You're trying to use it like some kind of magic formula. That's a blasphemy. According to the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus means according to his will. That's what it is. So when we desire what he wants, then we pray according to what he wants and things begin to happen. Amen? When you pray according to the name of Jesus, you are invoking all that God is, his person. And God is personal. And he doesn't expect us to use magic formulas to accomplish spiritual results or even physical results. This is the type of power we have. 
But it is not power according to our will, but power according to His will. And because our will has been transformed to be like His will, therefore we can be confident to ask for anything. Not anything in the flesh or our sinful nature, but anything in the Spirit according to our new nature. People are funny. They fear strange things. And Christians, though, can be fearless. We don't have to fear anything. We don't have to fear curses. We don't have to fear demons. We don't have to fear evil people. We can be fearless because Jesus is right here with us. We are in the heavenly holy of holies with him. And we have the power of an indestructible life flowing through our veins. Therefore, we can be fearless. In the Daily Nation some years ago, there was this funny story that I saw. It was titled, Ugandan on Charms Charges is Set Free. And the story read like this. A Ugandan accused of having charms has been freed. Busia magistrate Joseph Dururi ruled that Mr. John Nalwenge, arrested in Uganda, was supposed to have been prosecuted there because the Busia court lacked jurisdiction to try him. Mr. Nalwenge was allegedly found with, among other things, seeds of an unknown tree, animal parts, soil, a dog's head, and dust, which could cause fear, annoyance, or injury. <laughs> People actually find opportunity to fear. They look at little things and, and they, they get all afraid. And these people were afraid of someone carrying dust and a dog's head and seeds of an unknown tree and funny, funny, dirty things like this. And people who practice witchcraft are into those kind of things. They think that those little physical things can somehow affect their eternal reality. And I'm telling you, it does nothing. It's just children's games. Even if this guy was a witch, he had a dog's head in his bag. What is that? Isn't that foolishness? As if a dog's head or spiders or dog feces or whatever can, can do anything to anyone. We don't need to fear things when we have the power of an indestructible life flowing through our veins. When the possibility of something bad happens is mentioned, I have oftentimes heard Christians saying to me, oh, don't say that, don't say that. If I mention something bad may happen, Oh, oh, brother, don't confess that. Let me tell you, if it's not God's will, it's not going to happen to me because I am in his hands. I am in, under his control. I have surrendered my life to him. So nothing can come and harm me unless he allows it to happen. This is what we learn from the story of Job. People, when they're afraid of confessing something bad like that, they show themselves to be very superstitious. They show that they don't understand the real power available to them. The children's rhyme says, Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. This is taught to children so that they can not be uh, harmed by their, their friends who may say something cruel to them. And this is very true unless you allow those words into your heart, unless you allow them to affect you. They actually have no power over you. God says, I have plans to prosper you, not to harm you. That's Jeremiah 29, 10. Those plans are God's will for our life. And when God thinks about our prosperity, he's not just thinking about a car or a house or land or a job or children or whatever. He's thinking about our eternal reward. He's thinking about the eternity that we have with him. This life is a, a, a few blinks of an eye. It's a few seconds. It's a few minutes here on earth. Then we're in eternity forever. So when he thinks about, when he says, I have plans to prosper, he's thinking about your whole eternal life as well. And what you do here reflects on that in eternity. Job said, though he slay me, yet I will serve him. Job 13. Job understood that his prosperity, that his life, that his well-being was wrapped up in God. That even if he dies, he's going to serve him because he knows that he's going to be with him forever. 
We have no excuse not to accomplish something great for God during our lifetime. William Carey, the famous missionary to India, said this, Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. He understood what it meant to tap that greatness, that power of an indestructible life that we've been given. Have you allowed that power to manifest in your life? Have you allowed that, that power to be an overwhelming force in your life that so overrules every negative influence, every attack of the enemy, every, every terrible thing of this world, such that you have joy unspeakable and full of glory even when you face trials? I want to challenge you today to allow the power of an indestructible life to flow through your veins and to let it be the dominant force in your life. Jesus made the way. He entered the Holy of Holies. He made the possibility for us to never be separated from God forever and ever. He promised, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples and I will be with you until the end of the age. This is an amazing promise. And it causes us to pray according to his will and accomplish mighty things for his kingdom because we have the power of an indestructible life flowing through us. Hallelujah. Lord, I pray that people will understand this truth, that they will really come to grips with it, that they will understand the great thing you accomplished in our salvation, that we have nothing to fear. We, we can trust in you with our whole lives and your will will come true in our lives and great things will happen as a result of it. In the name of Jesus, let it be true in their lives right now, I pray. Amen. If you would like a DVD copy of this message, send 300 Kenya shillings by Mpesa to 07 17 17 17 07. Then text to the same number your name, PO box, and message title. And we will mail you a DVD copy of this message. If you would like to support this ministry, send your donation to pay bill number 366783.